Hey everyone, hopefully this is working. Just wait for the preview to show up. That's working correctly for me, and we'll get going. So, yes, hello, and um, welcome to my, well, first ever live stream uh, doing this. So, this is in honour of the one year anniversary of my channel. So, thank you for everyone that's been supporting me all year round, and new and old. And thank you especially for my Patreon subscribers for this live stream. So, this live stream, what I'm going to be doing is making a game completely from scratch. And the game we're making today is going to be based upon feedback I've got from my patrons. So my patrons um, have come up with the idea of uh, making a horror game in honour of Halloween, obviously, because being next week. So we're going to be making a horror game, a first-person horror game, and we'll be making it uh, a, a sort of single-room, uh, single-enemy type game, similar to like Alien Isolation and, and so forth. Now, during the stream, it is completely live, so what I'm doing is I am going to be explaining everything as I go along and hopefully uh, teaching you some things as we go. Now, everything I'm covering in this video is either already a video on my channel or will be in the near future. So, things like AI, for example, will be part of this stream, um, but obviously, I don't have a video series out on that yet, but that will be out in the near future. So, I'll try and explain things as slowly as I can. But I do want to keep some pace going forward as we are making this because I want to try and get it done. Now, this part of the uh, this first part of the stream is a free for all for everyone on YouTube. Uh, however, if you want to see the second part, it is exclusive to Patreon subscribers. So, if you want to support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar, you can catch the second part straight away. This whole video, uh, both parts, will be available. Uh, to uh, everyone on YouTube and uh, obviously apart from the Patreon exclusive one which will be exclusive for patrons forever um, so if you want to catch it at a later time you can do rewind things you can do at a later point so don't worry if you can't keep up um, but hopefully what I'm trying to show in this is showing my process of how I'm figuring things out as I go and um, yeah hopefully be quite good fun a good little challenge so anyway let's just get cracking so uh, yes, I've got the chat open on the left hand side on my other monitor here. So hello everyone that's watching and uh, yep, as I said, the video will be going on the uh, archive. So I've started off here with the first person template. Now this is because I want to skip some steps and just get the first person uh, movement down. However, we're going to change a few of the things to make it more horror like. So obviously I'm going to get rid of the gun. I'm going to change the way they move and uh, add a sprint function to the character too. So let's start off with some of the character movement first of all. So I'm going to go into my first person character and I'm going to get rid of all the gun stuff. So I don't want a gun. Um, so everything that's up to here. So I'm now going to get a load of errors because I've just removed a ton of stuff. So let's just clear this all out. Uh, we don't need any of this junk. And we're going to get a load of area. This is all the shooting stuff, so we don't need none of this. Um, okay, so we've just got the movement and jumping. Uh, let's just give it a jump as well. We don't want to jump in this game. Let's give it a jump. Uh, so we've got movement and the turn and uh, looking up. So that should get rid of all those errors for us now. So let's play the game. Okay, so I can walk around my environment. Um, so I want to add a sprint function to my character. Okay, so there I've seen many ways of people doing this online. Um, there is, uh, well, in theory, a better way. I haven't tested it out, but it should work just the same. So to do a sprint function, where I'm going to hold shift to sprint, I'm going to go into my project settings and look for the input tab. And on the input tab, you're going to see action mappings and axis mappings. Okay, so on the move forward one, you've got all these uh, scales and all this stuff. And 
what I'm going to do is add another action action mapping up top here to do the sprinting. So action mapping and axis mapping, I've explained this before, but action mappings basically are 0 or 1, on or off. Axis mappings are a scale between minus 1 and 1. So it could be any value in between. So I'm going to click on action mappings and add a sprint function. And let's make that a shift key, the left shift in particular. Okay, so I'm going to now close this and go back to my first person character. And in here, we're going to activate the shift uh, function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave all this stuff as is, okay, because this is using add movement input, which is um, basically using the variable set on the character movement here to determine how far it should go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the values on this base and that shift key being pressed and released. So if I right click here and go um, sprint, and you see that input action turns up now. Um, on the pressed, I'm going to change the character movement here. I'm going to change the uh, max walk speed, if I spell it correctly. Get a set max walk speed. Pressed. And when it's released, I'm going to do another set max walk speed. Like so. So the max walk speed by default, in the first person template anyway, is 600, I believe it is. Where is it? Yep, max walk speed 600. So I'm going to change the max walk speed here when I'm pressing the sprint button to be 600. And by default though, I want it to be a walking speed of say, let's say 200. We might have to tweak that in a minute. So let's go back to my character movement and change that max walk speed to 200. Click compile, play. It's a bit too slow, but if I shift, let's sprint again. So let's just go back into there, make it a bit faster. Let's say 350. Remember to go back into your character movement, make it match that. Yeah, it's a bit more like it. Do maybe a little bit up, but we'll see how it gets on with the um, monster that we're going to put in there later. So now I've got a character moving around, I'm now going to have to build a level. Now I've designed a level uh, already on paper here, so I'm just going to block it out, okay? So I'm going to get rid of all this stuff inside my level as it currently stands. And for sake of simpleness, I'm going to get rid of the light mass, the post process. Uh, atmosphere fog and the template label and then network player start don't need that either and get rid of the reflection cube don't need that don't need that there we go so get rid of the most of this stuff here so i'm gonna do a thing called gray boxing now uh, where you basically block out your whole entire environment so i'll drag a first bit in set its location to zero 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 and x and y i'm gonna give it a large value because this will be a bit of tweaking and refining uh, so one thing i'm not going to do in this video is make tons of art uh, art takes a long time i don't know if i have the time to do that so uh we'll, we'll see but i don't think i'll be able to get much done so for the x y and z i'm going to make that uh, let's say 2000 for now see what that's like and z i'm going to put down as and thin that's a 20 drop my character down with the end key let's walk around okay this is way too small so i need to increase this massively okay let's go down here and let's just increase that to let's try 5000 get a feel of the space yeah okay not too bad so we go for that so now i'm going to need to build up my room so first of all i'm going to go into my box drag another box out and let's make this a room so x i'm going to make this uh oh let's go for 800 and by 1000 
and a height of say 300 how's that looking compared to the player yeah that might be all right and I'm gonna take this hollowed box so when I take this hollowed box you now got room really easily so let's just drag the player this is where the player is going to start so let's drag the player into there just play let's see about the height mm, a bit higher doesn't look too realistic so let's make that be 450 okay yeah this looks a bit more like it so this is my player's starting room okay um once i'm in there the player's going to come out into a corridor so let's make the corridor now let's put it this side so this was a height of what 450 was it yeah so let's make this the same so 450 height and let's increase this uh, width to say 400 and 500 okay so let's just butt that up like so so again i'm going to take the hollow box to make it nice and easy corridor transition so my next trick is I am now going to make another box here or oh, let's actually extrude this out so let's go to the geometry editing up here this tab here I can click on this and I can extrude yeah extrude this out like so Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on. Delete. Let's undo that. Let's just make that an actual length. Let's go 800 this way. I click apply. Now you may have to turn hollowed off and then on again. Maybe. Oh, okay, we'll just do walls. That's not going to work for us. So back to my geometry. Let's put a box in here. Okay, so 450 height. And width of, say, 20. And snap that to the end there. Okay. So let's make that a bit longer, obviously. So let's go for 800. And let's bring that to the end. Like so. We'll duplicate with the Alt key. Like that. In fact, let's use the room as part of the corridor. So let's rotate this. Like so. Um, make that a bit longer. Let's try 1200. Okay. Yes, we'll have that. Okay. Now I'm going to rotate it again. If I hold down Alt and Shift, oh no, no not in this case, just Alt, you'll it will duplicate it as you rotate it. And if you hold down Shift as you move it, the camera will go along with it. So it might be something you don't know there, but let's just bring that to there. So the player will come out of here into this corridor and go down the corridor like so. So let's make this wall a bit longer. So let's go say 4,000. So it doesn't matter if it overlaps anything just yet okay let's now duplicate this one hold down the alt key bring that to here 
And let's again increase the size of this one to 1500. Okay. Now the reason why you're doing grey boxing, usually at start, is because you're not 100% sure of the proportions and the sizes or anything, because usually you're going from a sketch, and sketches always turn out incorrect based on what you are actually modelling. So if you do a block out first of all, you can test the gameplay first, make sure the game is still fun. If the game is fun in this grey box, then it'll be fun with all the artwork. So that's why you tend to do this bit. Hey, I can leave that overlapping, I'm not too fast, I don't have to guess that one. I can do like 100, but that's going to be the cap to our corridor. So it doesn't really matter too much. Okay, I'm going to leave the roof off for now. I'll put that on later. I'm going to put a doorway though into this room here. So let's put like a doorway. So I'm dragging the box, geometry box out. These boxes are called BSPs, which is Binary Space Partitioning. It's a very complicated computing thing. <laughs> so don't worry about trying to explain how to do it. But essentially it's a way of the computer to... Um, basically partition off parts of the, the screen into a three-dimensional space um, let's change this to 350 but it allows us to manipulate their shape nice and easy uh, if I keep this that doorway gonna be big enough so now you can make it where it says additive you can change this to subtractive and it will cut away a hole in the door so let's just raise it up off the ground. Uh, I have to lower this one. In fact, let's just change the thickness of this to 20. Actually, a bit more. 40. Yeah, there we go. And lower that into the ground a bit better. Like so. Now let's test that out. Doorway seems a bit too big. Okay, so we need to fix that. If you need to click on the thing that's subtractive, go onto the door frame, click on the inside bit, and you'll get access to these settings here. So let's change that to 250. Ooh. How's that looking? Yeah, that's a bit better. Okay, so next is to line things up a bit better here. Like so. And I'm just going to click on all these wall pieces and lower them. Like so. So, so we can start in here, come around here, and a bit door there. Now the reason why I want to put this in here is I want the player to have a safe space to them to get used to controls. You typically want to do this, especially at the start of a game, is give the player a safe location where they can play around, get used to controls without any danger or risk to themselves. So this is what this is teaching the player in here. Then we're going to tell them how to interact with stuff by opening this door. And this corridor is going to be the first start of building suspense in a horror game. Um, corners are very scary in horror games. You typically want to put as many as you can because they obstruct the player's vision. So if we're here, let's just play it. So if we come out of here and look around the corner, uh, look at the corner here, we don't know what's around the corner. So we kind of like to obstruct the player's vision as much as possible. So when you put a corner in, players tend to peek out like this. Okay, this is just a safety thing. You typically do it in real life, so you do it inside a game too. So when using when you're making a horror game use corners to your advantage use them to obstruct the player's movement view anything like that so they have this corridor and what i'm going to do here is make a little cut scene where a monster walking past some windows here leading to a door leading into the room where the monster's in all to build suspense so let's actually make this a bit smaller so the player feels a bit more claustrophobic like so here and let's pull this out like that okay so now we've got the corridor done 
the next job is going to be the main room itself so here I'm just going to duplicate this wall here and put this over this side and this wall is going to be uh, a lot higher so we'll go 1000 okay let's duplicate and rotate and I'm going to do duplicate with the shift and alt key let's get rid of notifications again shift alt and bring that across like so okay and then we're going to bring this over here like here so we've got the wall poking out here let's just move that so it doesn't do that so if I comes around here walks into the big room okay so this big room isn't just one big empty room again going along with that corner methodology and theory we're going to place a load of corners everywhere and uh, smaller corridors and broken bits like so so let's drag those out so i'm just going to use these pieces that i've got here actually drag this out like so so this bit up to here has a little corridor here and i'll play a lot more loose this one i'm not going to bother with too many measurements i'm just going to scale it play a bit faster than loose Uh, made that a bit shorter. Okay. And then we're going to duplicate this. Actually, I don't like the way it's stretching the texture. Let's undo that and bring that back in. Uh, let's duplicate this. And like so, and just scale it here. So I'm just going to scale this in the Y a little bit more. So I want that to up to the edge like so. I'll make it a little bit higher. Okay, this is what I want. Nice tight corridor. Okay, so now I've got this piece. I'm going to duplicate and rotate with the rotate using the Alt key. And I'm going to move that... the end of actually let's make it a bit more narrow make this a bit longer uh, let's look shorten that a little bit move that there cool okay so we are going when the player comes into here they're going to have this little corridor to the left um which they are going to not going to want to go down because when they're coming down here we're going to see the monster walk to that left through the window so when we come through here we're like uh oh the monster's down there probably so let's not go down there when in fact that's where the player has to go so you're building suspense because you're trying to get the player to realize they need to go down this route they think the monster's there but when we get around the corner it's not going to be there okay so we're going to play a lot more um with the player's mind and mess them up a little bit hi phone thanks for joining hello from japan um so now i'm going to bring this across to here and let's make this bigger so i want this one to go across the whole thing like so okay next i want to do is i'm going to make the exit room so the idea of the game is the player's got to solve a puzzle while avoiding the enemy to get out of the uh, room 
So I'm just increase this by a thousand, and this by a thousand, and this by a thousand. I'll make it hollow, 40 width thickness, and this room is going to be the exit goal room, which I'm going to put at the end here. Like so. Okay, so let's just I'm going to raise it up a little bit because I want the player to feel exposed when coming into this room. So I want it up in the air a little bit and I'm going to use the stairs here to showcase that. Increase the step height a little bit. Um, we'll change the length, no, width. Mm, it's a bit too high, maybe. Like so. Okay. So now let's put the doorways in. So this door here. Okay, so that's going to be 450. Nice big uh, tall door. And this is going to be subtractive. So let's make it subtractive. And make it a big grand door. So 400 by 400. Well, that, that doesn't need to be 400 because it's obviously not going to go that deep. Um, yeah. Let's have it like that. And just raise this up a little bit. Cool. Okay, so there's the exit. The player has to get there. So we'll put the actual doors that bought, uh, block their exit in a moment. Let's put in the other doors first. So let's put the door into the main room. So here I'm just going to duplicate this one here. So I'm going to go Alt drag this in like so um, we'll put it we'll put it there okay cool so when we come in they'll see the immediate goal which is to get out um, let's see where the monster went which is to the left and they'll see another door there and a door over there too. So let's put those other doorways in. So I'm just going to duplicate this again with the Alt key. And let's just put that in over here. Like so. So the player has to come in here. And this is where I pick up one of their items. And I'm going to duplicate it again. Put it immediately opposite. Maybe not so immediately. Actually, no, we could leave it like that. Yeah, that'd be all right. We'll go there. That'll come across like so. Okay, next job are windows. So windows are really useful because they allow you to show the player something without letting them have access to it. So they work just like doors. So I'm just going to duplicate this. Rise up a little bit. Move it across. Hi, now shadow. Thanks for joining us. So let's just make these a bit smaller. And, and let's make this a bit bigger actually. 150, maybe 200, 200. How's that looking? Still a bit too big, let's, let's make them 150. Make it, yeah, 150. Okay. So I'm going to add these windows in places. Okay, so put one there, roughly. Yeah. I'm going to duplicate that out to another one there. Roughly. 
let go of all and push it again to make another one. So the three would do it. So when the player comes down here, they'll see the monster walk past the window briefly um, to the left. When they come through here, they'll see no monster there. So they must be going through like so. So let's put another one around here. Thank you so much, uh, Suraba. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thanks so much. So I'm now going to put another window. So another window I'm going to put is over here so I should start be able to explain uh, right, hi Jamie uh, would we create these subtractions or create a custom mesh so whilst you're doing block outs these subtractions are great because they get you the right sizes and the right scales typically what you have in a big team uh, development studio is you have your level designers dev design and build your grey box like this and when they finish with it uh, the level designers will have it and they'll be told make this look pretty so the level the artists won't have to uh, shouldn't be changing anything they should be just doing artwork for it whilst then the gameplay programmers are making the game fun and enjoyable in that space so i would suggest it depends on your workflow i prefer to do this first get my measurements scale out because then what you can do with this is you can actually export this out and put it into Maya or Blender, and you can use it as like a template to help your model around it. So, I strongly recommend that as a, um, a a method you do. Uh, we've done it in the past with my students, is that we modelled a castle, uh, blocked out a castle in here, sorry, and then we exported it into Maya, where we added lots more details and created their own meshes and more um, details like so. Uh, let's just get our window back. So, the window I'm going to put in here. Uh, yeah, we'll leave it. No, we'll rotate around to make it the same size. And put this like so. So, this window here is going to show the player there's a pickup here. Something for them to pick up. They can't get to it because there's a door over here that will be locked. So, they know they can get there. There's something there for them. They just can't reach it. So, the player has to figure out how way to get past this door. So they encourage to explore, eventually lead them to the path where the monster went. When they come down here, they'll see another locked door, and they'll see a key. They pick up the key, turn around, or a cutscene will play and they'll turn around. They'll see the monster is approaching them from this direction. So they can't run that way. We're forcing them, the player to use the key on this door immediately to the left. This helps teach the player that how to use keys. So they've got the key, get through the door, and out. It's at this point where the monster becomes a roaming entity around the whole level. So we're going to put in some things in here like barrels and crates and columns and things like that. They'll block the player's view of the enemy. Well, better yet, block the enemy's view of the player. So the player can sneak around successfully past the enemy. So let's put that uh, some of those things in here. So let's put some columns in here first. So let's try and make it structurally make sense. So here I'm going to make this a little bit thinner so I'm gonna go say 100 yes like so and make it nice and tall uh -huh. and let's put another one on this side okay um, and then I'm gonna duplicate this again Actually, let's select both of these. Hold down Alt, Shift, and now we've got them perfectly in line. Excellent. Oh. Although it does look odd with not in line with that door, so let's let's make it look more what you'd expect in real life and just line it up a bit better. Like so, so the doorway is in the middle of the room. Excellent. So we come in here and but we're blocked by the door. So I think it'd be better in this case to have the player see the door, the exit straight away. So let's move these back to where they were. And instead we'll move the door. So I'm gonna set the stairs, the doorway and the room. And I'm just gonna move it along a little bit like so. So let's see from the player's perspective in here. Yes, yeah, so they'll see the door straight away as they'll see, okay, that's the way out. So we'll go through there. So 
that's pretty much it for the structure and let's put some more crates in here so let's put them in a box in here and let's more make it more janky like so and let's see how that matches up with the player's height in the game Uh, sorry, meant for modular system it's fine design. If you create the map, this would be correct measures to match after I've heard that. Uh, yes, you 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 wouldn't use subtractions in the final game. You take all this stuff out in the final game. Typically, you replace it with artwork, such as modular design. Once you've got the proportions down, you can build your modular sets. Um, you'd make the doorways actual meshes. You make the windows actual meshes, and you make a modular system um, out of this. Then you'd remove all this grey boxing uh, because it is a resource hog as you correctly suggested um, yes uh, yes you that's exactly what you do so the height of these boxes are pretty good we'll leave them as that um, let's put a, bit, a few more in here so I'm gonna put one there I'm also going to put one over here somewhere because I don't want the player to be able to just do a straight gun for this door over here I want them to have to go somewhere and branch off so it makes them a bit more uneasy so let's just put a block in their way and let's move that out like so so you're constantly with level design trying to push the player into where you want them to go so here I'm trying to get him to stop going straight to the, for the goal. So here, let's just put this like so. And let's put another one on top, and that'd be quite fun. Ooh. There we go. So when the player comes out of here, goes down the corridor, sees the monster, goes through this door, which will be a one-way door, um, they'll go down here, eventually come down here, see the key, pick up the key, turn around, see the monster, oh no, what to do, I'll use the key in this door, get out, and now I'm in the back in the main room, you're like, aha, I'm back here, I recognise this place. And now the player's themed to roam um, this area. So the idea of the game is they come over here with the key, come through here and pick up, say, a lighter or something like that. And the aim is they've got to light three or activate three switches. So I'm going to say light, let's say light three candles. So I'm going to light a candle here. And then we're going to make them go back and find the other two somewhere in this room. Now, these could be in good uh, typical locations by the door or wherever you want them to be. Um, we'll see what happens when we get there and how hard it is with the enemy walking about. Uh, the enemy might be too easy or something like that. So we'll we'll tweak it as we go around. So let's just do that. Uh, let's put a few more boxes in here. So because it looks kind of one sided this room, so let's put another one over here. Yeah, you can make a modular set before starting. I say everyone does it differently. Um, if you're doing a grid-based modular system, it's a lot easier just to start straight away. So, yeah, you can definitely do that. Cheers, Jay. Thanks, man. So let's put a couple more boxes around here. Do, 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 do. Let's put another one on this side of this column here. I don't want to put too many, otherwise it'll look like a warehouse. I don't want it to be a warehouse. So we'll leave that as is for now. We'll see how it is with the enemy when we get to the enemy part. How are we doing for time? Cool. Okay, so we've got most of the level put together now. We just need to put the doors in. So we're going to be making some doors. Now these holes... I've made 
are 200 by 200 I believe or 200 by 250 so we're going to create this doorway in my uh, go to the recently placed or basic sorry we're going to make the doorway here in the content browser so let's make a door now we've got two types of doors I've got uh, a one-way door and uh, two-way doors so let's do the one-way door first of all so if you followed my door to tools you this will be familiar so I'm going to go to new blueprint class an actor uh, door one way and this chap here is going to have a cube and this cube by default I believe is uh, how can we see it show details I think it's a hundred by a hundred uh, ah, there we go yeah hundred by hundred so let's change the size of that so if my door is 200 by 250 uh, the X needs to be 2 and this one here needs to be 2.5 and the Y will see be the thickness of the door so let's go to if it's let's say 0 0.3 0 0.4 so let's go 0 0.3 that's a bit thick isn't it let's go 0 0.1 yeah that's a bit better okay so my door is going to be a hinged door so it's going to open on a hinge and for that to work i'm going to well first of all let's increase the height of this so that's not at the base like so um for this to work i'm going to add a hinge component now a hinge is basically a scene component so you add a scene and this is going to be called hinge and i'm going to drag this so it's not a child but rather the parent of the cube now before i do that it might be best actually if i turn that off and just move the hinge oh hello move the hinge to where I want the hinge of the door to be. So doors can open to the left or to the right. I'm gonna put this to the left here. And I'll make the cube a child of the hinge. Now the reason why is because then when I rotate the hinge, the door rotates too. Okay, so we're gonna be doing the timeline transform on the hinge. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for the support. Um, so to do that, we need to, first of all, add also the box collision before I forget. And this is going to be the trigger box. I'll leave this box. And let's increase the size of this thing. Increase the size of it like so. Okay, so it's a one-way door. So I'm going to make it so it only appears on this bit. And let's increase the height of it a little bit. And make it clip through the door like so. Perfect, so this will be the one that they have to be in to open the door. So once we've done that, we are then going to come out there and open the door. So click compile, go to your event graph, and let's begin. So with the box clicked, uh, selected on your component list, you're going to right click here, and we're going to do on component. Uh, let's just do begin overlap, it's easy. Add on component, begin overlap box okay so first thing we do is going to check whether or not this is the player so i'm going to go other actor cast to player uh, third person first person sorry cool blimey first person character and the first person character as we've done in the past basically checks whether or not this is the first person character object going in here because i don't want the enemy to open any doors by accident so when we come out of here we're then going to enable input. So we're going to get the player controller and enable input for this door. Make sure I plug the player controller into the player controller here. And let's do the end overlap whilst we're here. So click on the box again, go end overlap. Again with the cast from the other actor 
first person character and we're going to disable input like so Like so. Okay, so with the input enabled, we can then do the E key. So let's do uh, E input. Let's do E key. Might make it quicker. There we go. So the E key will be pressed to open the actual door. So for this, we need to make a timeline. I'm going to go add timeline and I'm going to do door animation as the timeline so when I pushed E key and I've enabled input so E key will work this door animation will play double click on the timeline we're going to add a float to this and we're going to do hinge angle as a float track and I'm going to click on shift click here and shift click again first one we're going to zero zero it out and here I'm going to go um, let's say do one for now and value of 90 because I want my hinge open 90 degrees so 90 there click compile and change the length of this to be one compile again and we're done with the timeline so the timeline is going to spit out the hinge angle so i'm going to go to my hinge drag the component out onto my blueprint so i've got a reference to it and then from the hinge we're going to go uh, rotate ooh, rotation add uh, set relative rotation and i'm going to click on uh, sorry up, connect it to update the new rotation i'm going to right click here and split this and hinge angle is going to go into the new rotation of Z the yaw which handles uh, this that's the Z okay so if I click on here this will go between 1 and 90 so if I was to increase this by 90 it will open like so okay so what else? Oh, we need to close the door. So when we leave this, we're going to come out, disable the input, and reverse it. And that should do it. I think we'll see. Compile and let's drag one of these in. Like so. Click play. Go up to the door. Hit E. E. I'm out. So the door closed behind me. I can't go back in because we only put the box collision on one side. But one thing I noticed was when I started walking through it, it closed on me. See? Which I don't want. It's a bit clunky. So let's fix that. Let's add a another box collision on it. So I'm going to add another box collision. And this is going to be uh, exit box. And let's plug this on the other side too. That should be easy if I duplicate this one. Because I want it the same size. Exit. Okay. Compile. And I want to do an on component begin overlap for this one. So end overlap, sorry. And this one is going to handle the reverse, not this one. Compile, close, play. Open up. Oi. Yeah, don't worry, level devil. It's all been saved and archived. So, what happened there? So, obviously, I... What happened? I left... It shouldn't have closed. It should have just... Aha, what was that? So... It's just reversing itself. So why was it reversing itself? So on begin end overlap. So here I need to also not do this until. Uh, let's do. 
Let's make that a begin overlap. And reverse it. But I'm going to move the exit point further away. Like so. So I open the door. What are you doing? Ah, oh, see, I thought this would happen. Come live, problems will happen. It's all part of doing live. Okay, so and uh, begin overlap. D -d 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 push E. Do animation plays. Reverse. Begin overlap. Exit. I'm not doing that yet. So why is that triggering? Let's disconnect it for now. Come through. It should close. So why is that? Why is that playing silly buggers? I'm going overlap, exit, reverse from end. Let's try it from end. Oh wait. Oh, I'm silly. We didn't do the cast. My bad. So the reason why it was triggering is because the door itself was hitting this begin overlap. Silly thing. There we go. And reverse. There we go. So I'm actually put that back to the way I had it. So let's go back into here. Put this back onto here. Compile. And change this to an end overlap. Okay. There we go. That's more like it. Cool. Right, now we've got one door. Let's put them all in. So that's the uh, one-way door. So the next thing I want to do is put one here. And the tricky thing is I don't know which one's which. So let's go into here and make one a bit more obvious which one's which. So this is the exit. I'm just going to make that small. There you go. Makes it a lot easier. Because the player's the right height, it'll hit both of them no matter what. And we'll just put this here like so. So player wakes up in this dark room. Get told to leave the room. Come out here. See the monster. And open this door into this world here. Cool. The next one is the locked doors. So this is a locked door here. And that's going to be a locked door there. And those will be open, openable from both sides. So I'm going to duplicate this. And go door. And just call it locked. Uh, both. I say locked both. So this will vary because uh, we'll be able to access it from both sides. So we don't need the exit for this. We just need the box. And I'm going to change its width to cover both sides like so um, we'll get rid of our exit because we don't have that anymore and we need to now when we end overlap the box disable input we're going to reverse the door so this will now open from both sides let's just test that out for sake of testing, I'm going to keep the move the character now outside of this level here. Okay, lock both. So if I go in here, should be able to open the door one way, the other way. So the issue you find here is that we want it to open away from the player. This is quite important in horror games because you want the player to run away from monsters a lot of the time. So you want it always to be opening and uh, away from the player. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to fix that with a uh, bit of code here. So the way this works is we're going to work out which way the player is approaching the door. And we do it with a dot product. So 
when we interact with the door, we want to do a few things. Yunk. That across like say. So here I'm gonna make a new variable, and this is gonna be a direction, I guess. We'll call it direction. And we'll make this a integer and compile. So I want to get the player uh, rotation. So I get player actor or character. Get actor rotation. And then we can compare that with the actor rotation of the door. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a dot product between the two. So if I type in oh, dot product uh, I should be able to just do do that. There we go. This will spit out a value. Now if I were to do this to a print screen, uh, let's just do in a tick here so you can see what this does. Print string and put this like so. I've only got one in there so it should be alright. So this basically changes the dot product based on which way we're facing compared to this one. So here I'm facing basically the same as it and you see it goes into a negative value. So it should be Ah, it's because ah oh, my stupid door. <laughs> All right, let's fix that. So my door, I've stupidly put it on the wrong axis because so, it's doing a forward from x vector, which is that way. I want to get that from the y vector. I don't know if they have one for that. Get rotation. No. Okay. All right. Let's just easy fix. Let's just rotate this thing. 90 degrees. Oh. Uh, cube. Move the hinge first, and then the cube. Okay, so this. Oh. Rotate the hinge. There you go. Right, now it's going to get the right vector because it's going from X. So, let's do that demonstration again. So there's the door. If I'm facing the same way as it, you see the value gets closer to 1. Uh, whereas over here, it gets closer to minus 1. So what we want to do is we want to change it which way it goes based on that value. So I just thought it was a decimal, or a float rather. So we're going to round this up to a value. We'll keep the tick there because I'm going to still show you how this works. So here we're going to round and you see this rounds to the nearest integer and I put that up there like so click compile and if I was facing the same way as it it goes 1 facing the opposite way it goes minus 1 so now I can use that value as a multiplier on a direction here so I'm going to set the direction of this when I've pushed the E key. Like so. And then when we get to here, when we're setting the rotation of it, we're simply just going to go get direction and multiply this by a int by float, the direction. So sometimes you may have to twist this around a bit. Uh, depends on what way you put the hinge. 
So let's go up here, push E. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's happened there? What's going on there? That's a weird thing. Do, 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 do. Let's turn off the reverse for now. Because that may be what's causing some issues here. So go up to the door, push E. Why is it doing that? Hmm. What's well, gone on wrong? Oh, let's print this string so we can see what's going on here. That's one. Where's the collision box gone? Hang on, something's funny going on. Let's make this visible in the game so we can see what the hell's going on there. Minus one. Why are you being weird? Right. I think I know what's going on. I think if we put this back into reverse, compile it. So why is that reversing like that? Oh, these bloody things. Um, end overlap. Reverse from end? No. Why are we getting this? It should just rotate the hinge. Oh, it's because we've rotated it here. Oh. Right, okay, in that case. Right, the reason why it's going wrong is because we rotated in here to fix which way it's facing. So, rather than set the relative location, a uh, rotation, I want to set the, uh, no, add uh, relative rotation split I think that'll do it we that's not right <laughs> Oh, all because I built this bloody thing on the wrong axis. Um, okay, okay, okay. Right. Let's just remake this bit here, because that's what's causing all the issues here. So let's just get rid of this, get rid of this, and just redo a cube. So this cube here. Let's change it to be two. No. 0.1, Position it where you want it to be. So, add a scene component. This will be a hinge. Reorganize the hinge a bit. Oh, I should have disconnected it first. And put it in its right location. Uh, yeah. And then put attach the cube to the hinge. So when we rotate the hinge, this rotates, cool. Right, so now we get, have to fix this. So set relative rotation, put the hinge onto this, 
compile. Test this out now. There we go. Right, as I said, it depends on which way you build this, the direction may be wrong. So what you need to do is simply multiply this int by minus one and I'll do it the other way around so this should now open away from me okay let's make it close uh, so over here go to it first and give it that pinch string now compile play so go up here open away from me walk out it closes behind me there you go it always opens away from you got there in the end okay so that's one of these doors so there's two of them uh, that's not all they do though they are also locked so we need to make a special bit more code for them to indicate whether or not we've got the key so let's just put these in position first of all Like so, and let's just duplicate and hold down shift. I could put that in the other way there. Okay, dookie. So now we've got these two doorways which will open away from us at all times. So the idea is the player here picks up the key and then it goes through. There we go. Yeah, I know, like, M-Zone, it's, yeah, live. I knew it would go wrong. But it's good because then you guys get to see me mess up and also how I figure it out. And if we go through here, you can see the door. Nice and easy, opens where we're going. Okie dokie, so. The next bit we need to do is make it so they're locked. So we're going to go in here. And what we're going to do is we're going to check whether or not the player has a key so let's go on to our player character and set a variable as key and that's a boolean being true or false that is and open our door locked so on the door locked um we are going to first of all check whether or not we have the key when we go to e okay so before we, after we push the e key we're going to go get the player character and cast to the first person character. Let's just make some space here. And from here we can get the uh, uh, has key and this will go into a branch so I did turn off my notification on Chrome but it obviously ignored me completely so if I have the key it will go into this and open the door if it doesn't then it won't open to test that out currently I don't have the key it won't open excellent so now we need to be able to pick up the key so let's put in a little pedestal here for the player to pick up a key so here I'm just going to drag a cylinder so I'm just using all basic shapes nothing special today just simple things and that'll be a pedestal for the player to walk up to and pick up a key from so here I'm going to make a new actor for the key And this key is going to have a static mesh component. Key mesh. And what I'm going to do is give it a simple cone. Let's go for that. 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Nice and small. And we're going to click compile. And we are going to place it into the world 
So I'm just going to put it above this little pedestal. Just hovering the air a little bit. So there's our key. So I'm going to make it so the player can pick up this key and then be able to use it on these doors. So we've got the key there. So next job then is to make it so I can pick it up. Now, a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, we can make it so that when the player's looking at it, they can pick it up. Or when they're near it, they can pick it up. So what I'm going to do, let's have a think. Let's try and do... Um, what would be good let's give it a, a box collision to trigger it compile and go now the box collision obviously is not is on a pedestal which is not where I want it to be I want to be able to move it so if I went and scroll down here to the box inherited here you should be able to move it independently from the rest of it so you can make multiple objects and change where the interact uh, zone is for these so let's just scale it up a little bit, like so. Okay, and this will work very similar to what we've done with the door. So the box, we're going to go uh, overlap, uh, begin overlap, and we're going to do cast to first person character. And then from there, if it's successful, we're going to enable. Oh, hello. Get the player controller, enable the input. So, exactly what we've done with the door. Exactly the same. And E. Um, yeah, we'll do E key. And. And then we'll do. Uh, what actually might be a good idea, as we cast the first one character, we'll we'll get that as yeah, we'll promote that to a variable. So don't do too many casts, and this will be player reference. Drag the player reference out here, get and now I can access the has key. Set has key to true. And after that, I'm going to destroy the actor, removing it from the world. So let's test that out. Kick play. Player runs down here. Doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop. Door won't open. Go up to the key, pick it up opens and they should be also be able to be able to open this one too very nice cool okay so that's pretty much all the interactive elements done apart from this big door here uh, the next bit will be the lighter so we're gonna make another pedestal for another lighter so I'm just gonna do the exact same pedestal I'll just drag it out here drop it down and we're going to make a blueprint class actor lighter so the lighter uh, this is going to be a simple pickup um, um, we'll go cube make it really small 0.1 0.1 0.1 and I'm actually gonna make it a lot flatter than 0.05 compile it again I'm gonna give it another box collision to trigger where it is okay just make the box not attached to the cube so that when we move it in the editor it doesn't matter there you go and if I go down here, click on the box, I can move that down here too. Ooh. One, one, one. And let's move that into the floor like so. 
and spread it out. So exactly the same, same thing again. Uh, I'm gonna go begin overlap. Now, if you're making a game with lots of these, the best thing to do would be making like an overall pickup um, parent and making these children because you're just duplicating the same code over and over again. So, but for this purpose, this will do. If at the end we have time, we may tidy things up by sorting out loads of things like that. So that's the first one the character. We're going to go from there and we're going to access a new variable which we haven't made yet. So let's make that variable. And we're going to make a has lighter compile. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go has lighter. Sorry, that doesn't go on there, does it? Forgetting steps. Uh, so we're going to promote this to a variable first. Call it play reference. And then from there, we're going to enable input and the player controller. Get player controller. And then we do the E key. But E, that's not E. E key. Like so. And when we push the E key, we want it to get the player reference and set has lighter to true and then destroy this actor like so click compile so now i can pick up that lighter and when i pick up that lighter i actually want to hold the lighter in my hand so here let's make this a uh, a new thing in our hand so let's go let's make another blueprint actor here uh, call it actor lighter in hand I guess for lack of a better word so lighter in hand we're going to make a, another static mesh And we're just going to use the cube for now. And I'm going to change that to 0.05. And I'm also going to add a particle effect to this, which would be the fire that comes built in. Obviously, it's a bit extreme and it's not what, exactly what a lighter does, but it'll do for this thing here no idea if that looks good we'll see so let's go into our first sort of character and add this um, actor to our thing so I'm going to go child actor and I'm going to call this lighter and I'm going to go choose the actor on the right hand side here, it's lighter in hand. And let's see how this looks in game. So if I click on my player character, where is he? There we go. We can see the lighter in his hand here, so if I move it like so, I compile. And let's just play that, see how that looks in the hand. Whoa, why is it going all weird? Hello, what's going on there? Uh, lighter needs to be part of the first of the camera. And play. No, what's going on there? Why is it being weird? Let's just remove the lighter. Why is that being like that? Add child. Oh. 
child actor attached to the thing and we'll go over here sorry lighter in hand let's just see if that works what is this <laughs> right okay Something wrong with the lighter in hand. Why is that being weird like that? It's a particle system? What's the causing that to do that? Uh, let's get rid of the particle system. It should not be doing that at all. What is this? Uh, <laughs> what is going on? Um, okay, right. No idea what's causing that. If you've got suggestions, by the way, throw them into the um, into the chat. Uh, <sighs> right. Hmm. No, I I can't fathom why movement changes when you've got a child act on it what the hell causes that uh never seen this before so why is this being weird make the static mesh the root maybe hello hello right it doesn't like having a child actor for some reason no idea why. Uh, da, 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 da. Would it be the mass? Um, I don't think so. I don't think I've put any physics on it. Yeah, and there's no physics on it, so it shouldn't be that. Let's change. Uh, let's change the collision uh, to n uh, no collision. That might be it. There you go. Yes, no collision. Thanks, Jane. Gave me the uh, the spark of inspiration there. So let's just put another default scene route onto that. Particle system. Uh, let's put a fire back onto it. Crazy fire. Uh, where's the player? There you go. Let's just move that to the side here. Compile. So when we've got a lighter in our hands. Looks really crap, but it will do the job. Okay. So now with the lighter in our hands, we can then want to be able to activate three candles, okay? So we can activate one at the end of this corridor and two more somewhere around here. So let's uh, make them. So let's put another pedestal thing in there. So the pedestal here, I'm going to put actually at the start over here. end there and then we'll put another one there and another one here somewhere uh, let's put that just over here <laughs> it would be a cool yeah it would be very stylized it's just got a bonfire on it um right okay so we've got our three pedestals we've got one there uh where's the one one there and one there okay so the last thing we need to do for interaction wise before we get onto ai is create the candle so in here 
we're going to make a uh, static mesh. And the static mesh is going to be the cylinder. Like so. Obviously I want it a bit smaller than that. So 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Pile and we'll add a particle system to this, which will be the fire, which we will turn off and on based whether or not it's lit. So, here, fire, again, it's crazy, so it's not going to down to like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. We may even have time to make our own particle system later, we'll see how we get. So, and I'm gonna make a new variable for is lit okay so if lit is true it will uh, well we'll make it so it's set on fire so let's just put these in the world so far like so <clears throat> okay so there's three candles um, so let's make it so we can actually interact with them. So again, we'll make another box collision. Um, and make it show it's not a child, so it's separate, so we can move it later on. And on the event graph, we'll do exactly the same that we did before. So I'm going to go um, begin overlap. Other actor, cast to first person character, promote variable, player reference, and then enable input. Get player controller. Thanks, James. Yeah, I'll. I'll want to get into the mode of making more live streams we'll see how this one does and then uh yeah we'll make some more in the future definitely i, I enjoy just i enjoy the challenge of just trying to make a game from scratch without any real prior planning the only thing i planned for this one was just a map um so we're gonna go e key oh it helps if i spell key correctly and go to pressed okay so player reference we're going to get the play reference. We're going to get the has lighter boolean. If it's true, go into a branch. If it's true, when we interact with it, is lit is become true. Okay. And if it's true, then we're going to ignite this park system. So, park system. I believe you can turn them off. Let's have a look. Um, disable. Uh, set. Oh, what would it call it? Um, set template, maybe. Set template. There we go. I'm going to set that one to fire up here we'll get rid of it up here so if lit is true it'll turn on the fire um, right okay let's close this down now I've got the lighter hello box we want to be able to access it from all angles, so let's just spread that out across like so. And let's just test it for this one. So if I go up to this candle here, push E, push E, no, excellent. All right, how far is it getting? So if something goes wrong, I typically will put in print strings along the way to figure out how far it gets inside. Uh, inside this uh, 
Okay, so that's working. Um, get to, oh, it has lighter, is true. I need to tell you the player character to make it true by default. That's why. Uh, request first some character. Default true for now, because we're just testing things out. Okay, now go up to here, push E. There you go. Candle's lit. Cool. So, now I need to tell it so the player does not have a child actor until I pick up the actual as lighter. So, we're going to go in here, and child actor, we're going to set as none. Click compile. And in here, click on the lighter. Uh, lighter. Over here, has lighter. And then we're going to get the child actor. Child actor. This one here. And the child actor you can access then get actor. Or sorry, set actor we want. Set actor. No. Get it right, Ryan. Set actor. Uh, he wants this one. And you want to make it the lighter in hand class. Cool. Okay. So now I've got no nothing in there so the player has to go around this way and pick up this key open the doors can't turn on light the candles yet get over this way and take this door pick up the lighter and then we're gonna make them light all three candles Oh, I haven't lowered the trigger box on that one, but on this one, I have, so let's test it. There we go. Cool. So let's just lower the trigger boxes for each of these candles. Like so. And this one over here. There we go. So that's most of the gameplay done. The puzzle element and the doorways and everything. Uh, once all three candles are lit, we can open this door. So what we're going to do for that is let's just put in a new door. So this one will be a one-way door again. So I'm going to go right-click here and duplicate. Door. End. End door. So this door here is going to open, on, be only be openable, openable, yeah, openable if the, all three candles are, uh, are um, unlocked. So I'm going to create a function here. So I'm going to go on functions here and call it check candles. And this is going to check all the candles and check if they're all lit or not. Okay, so I'm going to go get all actors of a class and we're going to choose the candle and this is going to spit out an array which is a list of all the actors that are candles there should be three so for each one um we're going to go for uh for each for each loop yeah don't worry mark um, this will be saved and rewatchable later on. Uh, this at least the first part anyway. Second part will be open for all Patreon uh, members exclusively. Um, so here I've got the for each loop going through each of the arrays, and for each of these arrays, I'm going to check whether or not they are lit. So I can now access is lit, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a count for this. So local variables, I'm going to go uh, candle count. And I'm going to set that as an integer and compile. 
So here, if it is lit, we're going to add one to the candle count by getting it and incrementing it. Oh, need to go to a branch first. Yoink, branch. Loop body into true there. So the branch is lit. If it's lit, then it'll increment the candle count. So hopefully that will hit three when we've got all the candles. Um, if at the end of it it isn't three, we're going to complete it here. We're going to go and check that value. So I'm going to go. Uh, we'll just do it here. Get to candle count. And we're going to go is equal to. In this case, we can type in three if we like, or we can go from the out actors here and get length. So we can add more candles later if we want, and um, yeah, makes it a bit more, a bit more versatile. So here I'm going to go branch into the completed. So if it is true, if our candle count is high enough, we're going to unlock the door. So on the variables here, I'm going to go is locked is true boolean and is locked uh yeah boolean by default is true i drag the is locked it out and set on the true there as false and might as well on the false here put that there like so so check candles is locked will come out of this and if we want we can make a little return value if we like um, for this um, you click on the check candles here and you got outputs you'll see a return node come up tick the is locked first and put it there and it's locked goes into the new parameter so that will return out the is locked value if we need it later on. It's quite useful to do that, but you don't need to. So this is going to check the amount of candles, how many there are uh, that are lit by counting how many there are, incrementing it. If it when it's completed, the candle count is uh, equal to the length of it. We can make it is locked is false. If not, is true, and we return it. Before I return it, what I'm going to do for sake of um, making it clear we're going to drag candle count out here and set this back down to zero if it is false okay so it resets the count cheers kevin it's good to hear i'm glad you like them so i'm going to click compile go back to the event graph on this dude and what we're going to do is on the check candles we're going to call this on when we push the e key so drag your check candles out and hook it up to the pressed and if it is true put it into a branch the true node will then go into the door animation and the false we can make a little widget ui up here say like you need to light all the three candles or the dark is still dark or whatever nonsense you want to put on the screen uh, you can put that up there like a riddle so now this door will only open when all three candles are lit. So let's check that theory. So let's run around and get all the bits and pieces. Open here. Go through the door over the other side. And pick up the lighter. So now we're going to go light all three candles. Let's first of all show that would help if I put the door into the actual level. Damn. Okay. That was a big boo boo. So let's just scale that up. Now. There we go. Oh, let's do it again. Right, so <laughs> back round. We're going to go round to the key. Pick up the key. Go through the door. Uh, show you can't go through. Ah, uh, why is that opening? 
Check candles. It's locked. It's true. That's because it is locked. It should be false. If it's false, it should open. Silly me. So come around here. Pick up the key. Key. Door. Door. And the lighter. Light this candle. Show you that we can't open the door. Okay, it doesn't open. But if we go around and light the other two candles. That one's lit. And now that one's lit. We should be able to open this door. And exit to freedom. Okay. And there we go. Okay, so that's the pretty much the gameplay of the level done. Um, all that needs to be left now is the enemy. So the enemy is going to be using... Um, I'm, I've cheated, I'm going to use Mixamo. Um, so Mixamo is really useful for animations and characters and things like that that you want to get uh, pre-animated. Now, the downside to Mixamo is that you can't direct... Well, you shouldn't be directly using Mixamo animations in Unreal. Uh, they don't support it. And you can tell that because they don't have the correct uh, skeleton with the root node or anything like that. So we need to uh, fix a lot of that um, down the line with uh, Maya. So let's just import this in first. So let's make a new folder. And I'm going to call it Monster. And let's import this in. So I think I'll put my desktop. In here, monster animations. Okay, so let's just get a monster idle, mutant idle. Yes. Uh, no skeleton, because it's new. Uh, why has it not got a mesh? Bear with, let me have a look at my Mixamo. It should import with a mesh. Did I not include the mesh in the tick the boxes? Um, maybe this is the mesh. Yeah, this is the mesh. Okay, so skeleton none import. Uh, yeah, that's fine. There we go. So here we have um, the skeleton zombie monster that we're going to be using. Uh, I've just got it from Mixamo. What's going on with its texture? Mm -mm -mm. Let's have a look at its texture. Because something isn't right. Pardon me. Uh, Right, okay, so what we've got here, so this, uh, for some reason, is thinking that this is translucent, well it's not, it's meant to be opaque. Uh, emissive color, da, da, da. I don't know why they've put, it's put that into there automatically, but we'll see if that does any better. Cool. Okay, so there's our, character, our monster that's going to be chasing us around the level. Pretty horrific looking, which is exactly what we want. So I've got the T pose. I now need to include the animations. So I've got import. I've got these animations here. So let's go mutant idol, maybe. Let's see if that works. So I'm going to choose the skeleton that I've imported in and click import. Hopefully this works. And there you go. There is idle. Stretching. Being cute. Okay, so we're going to save this and close this. So I'm just going to keep it as idle for a moment. Um, we're then going to... Let's load up Maya whilst we're here. Because we're going to need to do that in a moment. 
So the mutant we're going to need is a new blueprint. So I'm going to go right click here, blueprint class, and we're going to choose a character. Okay, you want a character because it wants to be walking around. Okay, so characters have the walking ability. So here I'm going to go uh, monster. And let's organize this a bit better. So we go new folder, animations, and drag that into there like so. New folder, materials, and we'll put textures and materials in that. Uh, move here. Uh, I don't know what these are, these are nothing really, these aren't going to be used, but I'll put them in this folder anyway. And this is a physics asset, so if we want to do ragdoll, that's what that is. And this is of course a skeleton. Now, as I said, the skeletons in um, Mixmo are not really applicable for uh, Unreal. The reason being is that Mi Mixmo use, if I show you the bones... They don't have the uh, root. The root should be at the base of the feet. Okay, they use the hips as the root, which is not what you want. You want it at the bottom. So we're going to fix that in Maya. So let's go into Maya and let's import that in. So import. Also, you can do this in Blender as well. Um, it's totally fine. Uh, sound effects, sound animations. And we'll just do the T-pose for now, so you can see how it's fixed. So, essentially, you've got the hips here. Let's just turn on X-ray joints. And we're going to add a bone to the bottom of the feet. So, if you go into the rigging menu here, we can add a new bone here. I'm just going to click and hit enter. And give it a sec, because it's been slow. Why is that not selected? Is it? I think it's put into the hierarchy, hasn't it? No. Oh no, that's the. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So here we go. I'm gonna name this one root. And the root you want to put at zero zero zero. So zero, like so. And then the hips, we're going to pair it onto the root. Okay. And now that's what we want. So I'm going to save this, or export it rather. Export all. And I'm going to overwrite the one from Mixamo. Go back to Unreal. And I should be able to just re import. Yeah, the alright rig may do this. Um, I've seen some other plugins do this fixing of the um, Mixamo animations, but they don't do it entirely, uh, especially when it comes to moving ones and, and do, when you're doing root motion. Uh, we'll get into that probably in the second part, um, but we'll see how we get on. So, why can't I just re import this? I click re import, there we go. Do, 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 Cattle. Right. Let's just fix all these animations right now. Let's just delete everything that's here. And re-import it all. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. Right. Let's do that for, again. So... This one we fix, so let's go into open, no skeleton, import mesh, and tick skeletal mesh, click import. And once it's imported in, we should be able to see that new root bone, which is what we need. Uh, we might have to fix that material again, yes we do. So let's just fix the material, so it's opaque. Uh, make sure it's got all the right mask on it. I don't know why it thinks that's an opacity mask. That's not. Uh, normal map. 
uh, emissive. I don't know what's emissive for the character, but there you go. Uh, we've got the specular, and we've got the diffuse. Okie dokie. So, we've got that dude lined up. So now I need to fix the idle animation. So if I go and delete this, oh sorry, go new scene, don't save, and import in my idle animation. We go into here. So now I have to do exactly what I just did, make a new route, and set it to zero zero zero. Name it root, and put the hips as a child to it. Now, it's important to note that you want to make sure, in idle it's fine because it doesn't move, um, but what when the hips are moving, are translating, i.e. they're moving X, Y, or Z location, you want to change that movement onto the root. Okay, that allows you to do root motion. Um, or you can make it fix in space, whatever you want to do. So, We've got an animation there, so I'm going to export all. That's mutant idle, so click export all. Yes. And now I can import that animation. Uh, make sure it's choosing the right skeleton. Export your time. Import. Now we have an animation that's using the correct skeleton. Okay. There's a root. So let's now do something a bit trickier and that is it's walking so I'm going to go new scene import and go to walking so this is where mixed mode is very different and weird because if you push play it goes off now we don't want it to do that necessarily um, because we also need to add a route to it or you may also want it to stay in motion in place but it depends on the animation for it so if you want it to stay in place that's typically because you want nice smooth consistent movement whereas this monster is going to be like plodding at, and so it's not moving at a constant velocity so you want to change that velocity with each step so we're going to use root motion to control his movements okay so to do that we need to add a root and have motion to that root so if i add a root to it and again set the translate to zero name it root and put the hips to the root. Now if I push play, you'll see the root stand still. That's not what you want. You want the root, that bit, to go with the hips. So the way you do this is with the graph editor. So bear with us and go into the graph editor. So if I click on this, to show both. You can see, if you don't know how the graph editor works, you can see it basically plots the movement of each uh, of the transforms on a graph. So you can see how each one is moving and changing over time. Um, like so. Okay. So what we need to do is copy and paste the translations on the hips onto the root. Now, the tricky part for this is that the uh, coordinate system in your um in mixmo it's very it's different to the one that's in maya so f for example uh let's just expand this out a bit so if i show you the translation in the z okay so this character is moving in the z axis okay that direction is the z axis in maya but if I click on the translate Z, and it should, maybe it's not Z, it's Y that messes up. One of them messes up, so it's Z, maybe it's Y. I don't know, we'll see how we go. <laughs> so, uh, we, we first of all we need to copy and paste all three of these. So I'm going to go dip and go edit. Edit, copy onto the root and go move this to the start. Edit, paste. Oh, need a set of key for this first. 
edit paste right so you can see where it's going wrong okay so let's undo that and do one at a time so the x-axis isn't moving much at all that's correct so I'm going to copy and paste this onto the x axis okay that looks about right okay so next I'm going to do is the z-axis let's that's the big one copy and paste into this Z axis. Okay, so it's kind of there, pretty much. All we need to do now is zero out the Z axis movement on the hips, because it's it's what it's doing is multiplying because the hips are moving as well as the root. So you're seeing the root move as well as the hips move away from the root relative to it. So what we need to do is go onto the translate Z for our hips. And here we are going, and let's copy paste that properly over here. Uh, there we go. Go to this Z here, we can select all these, and I want to change the values here to zero. So now you can see the root moves along with the whole mesh. Okay. Um, the last one we haven't done is the Y axis. So this one may be the one that's weird. So we're going to the copy this one into the Y. And we're going to go paste. So yeah, see Y handles <laughs> in Maya height. We don't want it to measure height. Okay, so the chances are that X and the Y seem to be the other way around. So we're going to copy the Y axis data. On the X here, we're going to paste it like so. And on the Y, we're going to zero it completely. How's that looking? Do, do, do. That's still a bit odd. Okay, in that case, we'll make it simple for ourselves. Let's get rid of the translation in the X. We don't need that. Uh, da, 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 da. Right, let's translate. Yeah, let's get rid of this X. And let's see how that plays. Okay, we'll keep it there. So, with that now fixed, the main thing you want to do is have this root move in sort of parallel with the hip. Okay? Because then you can work out correctly root motion. So, I'm going to go File, Export. Let's go Export All. And this was one mutant walking okay I'm going to go in here and on the import we're going to choose the mutant walking and click open choosing the correct skeleton and import okay and there is the root motion so you can see the root motion is that red line there okay now what we're going to do now is change this animation so it doesn't import all of it we only want it to import the animated time so if i go to the asset details for this we can change the animation length here to animated time let's see if that does any better here so once you've changed it here you can go to asset here and click on re-import mutant walking let's see if that fixes it and no it makes it even worse so let's work out when it stops moving or better yet, we can do it in Maya. So in Maya, it stops at frame 35. So frame 35, we're going to set a range on this. So set range, and the range is going to be 0 and 35. Asset, 
re-import. Why is that being weird? Is it playback really fast? Right. So I mean, mixed mode is just weird. Uh, why is that being weird? That's definitely seems to be playback really fast. Why is that playing back really fast? Because uh, 30 FPS, let's try that. Re-import. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. Now if you enable root motion, so if we go down here, and where is it? Root motion. Click enable root motion. This chap will just walk forever. Mm, it's a bit. That frame there doesn't match up to that frame there, does it? So why is that that way? Oh, I love animation. Okay, so. Da, da, what frame is the same as uh, is it that way in Maya? What are Mixmo trying to make loop? There are no other walking animations, so let's just have a look at that. Hang on. Bear with me. Mutant walk. Why is it being weird? Okay, let's just download this one then. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Okay, so I've got the mutant. I've got another walking animation. Let's just redo this then. Uh, import. Uh, hang on. Okay. File import music walk in. Yeah. New scene. Oh. New scene. Uh, don't save. Uh, import, we should walk in, import, there we go. Is that frame there should be the same as that frame there. Yeah, it looks right. Okay, let's do that again. So, make a new root, zero it, name it, root. Um, Let's now check the animation window. Uh, Windows uh, graph editor, sorry. Click on the root here. We're going to set a keyframe. And we are going to open up the hips as well. Okay. Right, so here I've got the Z axis, that's the main one, so let's get that, copy that, and go to this value here, and paste that in. Right, let's clear out then the other one, set that to zero. Do, 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 
do do. Okay, that looks right. We'll leave it as that. Go file, export all. Who's it walking? Export yes. And back in here, we're gonna go edit. And was that still thirty five frames? Let's have a look. Thirty six frames. So I'm gonna go in here and change that thirty six. Asset. Reimport. Okay. It still seems to be missing like its last couple of frames. Let's. What what's going on here? Uh, da, 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 da. Let's change that back. Reimport. No, now it's just being silly. I've had this problem before, and I can't remember how I fixed it. Uh, if you have any suggestions, by all means, throw them at me. Um, what can we do? It seems to be playing it really, really fast. This had better luck when we enabled default sample rate. But we're still losing a couple of frames. Let's increase the frame count here to like 40 and see what that does. Oh, there you go. That's a bit. Is it? I don't know. I can't tell. <laughs> uh, cool. Guesswork. We'll just keep guessing until we get right. Okay, let's try 44. That seems like it's hanging up for one frame. There we go. Cool. Mixmo. Great fun. So, there we go. There's animation of our character with root motion enabled. Okay, so what root motion does, it basically tells the model to extract the motion data from the root onto the whole model. So this will now move on its own, which is what we want. So let's actually make the play the character here. So we're gonna go blueprint class character. I'm gonna go monster. And in here, the mesh for this thing is going to be the zombie dude. And we're going to rotate that thing around like so. Okay, so now we need to make some animation for this guy. So let's let's organize ourselves a bit here and go um, put this 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 in here. New folder materials, and we'll put that 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 also in there. Okay, dokie. So, I'm going to go into the monster. Um, okay. Open blueprint editor. So, in here, we've got the mesh done. We now need to make an animation blueprint. So, I'm going to go right click and go to animation, animation blueprint. And I'm going to choose the skeleton zombie skeleton. And click OK. And go monster animation blueprint uh, we'll AB key dookie so animation blueprints um, essentially this is the better way to make animation especially for characters because you can do all sorts of crazy things with it uh, one such thing is a state machine so let's do a state machine for this guy a really simple one so the result this final animation pose basically is the output so what animation is it, is it going to be playing and this allows us to not just set an animation to it. So, for example, we could just drag a mutant idle onto it and click compile, and it'll be animating idly. Yeah, that's uh, height bones. Okay, which is all right, but not great. Just realize the idle animation is a bit busted too. We'll fix that in a minute. Um, so, we could do that, but you can also allow you to merge bones together and do other things. 
Now, what, as I said, the state machine is really good for this because we can go from the result here and just make a new state machine. And a state machine essentially tells it to decide what state, what animation state the character should be in. So double click on it to access the state machine. It's entry, we're going to come from here and go add state. And we're going to call idle. Double click on the idle state and that's where we drag our idle animation. Come back out of there using the arrows up the top here. And then from idle we can go into another state and that is walking. Open this up and drag the walking animation to it like so. Now you're going to get an error or a warning basically saying that the walking state will never be entered because we haven't set up a condition. So this is the condition which determines how it gets from idle to walking. So here we're going to have a boolean variable. So down the bottom you see variables, add the variable, go is moving. Drag that out and do get and plug it in like so. Now you also want it to make it go back. So you see this is one directional, it goes from idle to walking. We want this to also be going back on that too. So we can drag an arrow back to idle, double click on it. Drag is moving out to get, and we're going to do not equals to by doing an exclamation mark and then an equal sign. Uh, so just do just type in word not boolean, and that basically means when is moving is not true, then it can go back to idle. So that is moving variable comes from the event graph so the event graph is where we update variables and decide what state this character should be in let's try and fix that idle animation first of all so we get some nicety in it so yeah it's just playing hmm okay do animated time instead let's just play about Let's see if that loops okay. Yeah, close enough. So we'll do for that. So this guy we can now put into the world like so. Um, at first he won't animate. That's because we've made the animation blueprint, but we've then assigned it to it. So click on the mesh in the viewport mesh. And above where you choose the mesh you want to show, you'll see animation and anim class. You can choose that down here with the monster AB. Like so. So at the moment, he's quite small. Let's make him a bit more imposing. Let's go 1 1.5, 1 1.5, 1 1.5. 1 1 okay, and there is our big mini okay so the next trick is to make him to turn to move okay so that's going to be handled by ai now the ai we're using a behavior tree for this and what we're going to do is go right click here and make a new folder and type in ai and we're going to create a new, go to artificial intelligence here, behavior tree, monster underscore behavior tree, BT. And a behavior tree is a way of it deciding how it will, well, what behaviors it will do. Now the behaviors are handled by this tree in a very particular way. Okay, so... Um, the first thing we need to do is create a blackboard for it to store values to. Okay, so click on new blackboard up top and you'll see the blackboard data appears here. I'm going to call it monster underscore bb for blackboard. And over here in our behavior tree, we can decide which blackboard asset it's going to use. Click save, go to your blackboard and click save again.
So now the blackboard basically is a temporary location where you can store values that the behavior tree and other AI based things will use to store variables that may be interused by different tasks, different behaviors and so on and so forth. One such thing we're going to put on here is location. So I'm going to go choose a vector on a new key and put, type in target location and this will be the vector that it's going to be trying to walk towards could be the player it could be anything okay i'm going to click save go back to my behavior tree and i'm just going to make him walk around randomly okay for now okay later on in the second part we'll add more uh, finesse to his ai so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go new task and our new task is going to be making it find a location so whenever you make a new task, you want to um, rename it straight away. So it's a big circle thing here. N name it straight away because you, otherwise you'll fill up with loads of them and you won't know which, what is what. So here I'm going to call it find uh, random location. Okay, so on every task, you want to start everything off with an execute, receive execute AI. And you want to end everything with a execute, finish execute. Okay, every time. So receive execute AI, basically this will trigger as soon as the behavior tree, when we get onto it, what triggers this task. When it calls this task, this will happen. When this happens, pardon me, we want to find a random location around the map. So the thing we want to go for is find navigable uh, no. Random navigable. Yeah, here you go. Get. Get random point in navigable radius. And the radius, this basically looks at the nav mesh, which we're going to add in a moment, and finds a, a location that is uh, suitable for it to go towards. So the origin for this is we're going to look around the AI itself, okay, as the location. Now, an alternative would be put in the player in here so you can sort of cheese it so the ai is choosing a random location but it's always going to be walking choosing a random location near to the player so let's actually do that because it's a horror game after all we're going to get the player character and then from there we're going to get the player's location by going get actor location that's going to be its origin the radius for this is going to be something like a thousand so quite a large radius still um, and then what we're going to do is store this random location it spits out on this blackboard. So the way you do that is by making a new variable. And I'm going to call it vector. And this is going to be called a blackboard key type. So type in the search field here, blackboard. And you get blackboard key selector. This is going to be a reference to the blackboard itself. So the vector, uh, blackboard key selector choose get and then from there we can set blackboard value as vector so it's basically telling a location it's an address this address is setting a value and the value is this random location here and this will go into the finish execute and this will go into the start execute and the success of this it will be successful you want to make sure it is successful otherwise it won't pass this task and move on to the next one and yeah that'll do click compile so the next bit we need to do is make it so it, this task be called so back on the behavior tree everything starts with the root from the root you can put a selector a sequence or a simple parallel we're going to choose selector and then from the selector we're going to choose a sequence a sequence will play its children in a sequence. So it'll do that one, then that one, then that one, then that one. If one of them fails, it will go back to the sequence. Okay, and the whole sequence will fail. A selector will always pick the left hand most one first, unless this fails. Okay, if this, uh, sorry, not if it fails, this will choose the left one always, unless we give a condition, which we'll do later on. So the sequence, the first thing we need to do is find a random location. 
okay and one thing I forgot to do is you need to go back to your find random location task and on the vector variable we made we will make that public the reason why we make it public by clicking a little eyeball so then it is accessible by the blackboard so if you see vector which is the name of this thing here target location is what we've targeted it towards here so on the right hand side with it selected you can choose what vector points towards on the blackboard in this case we've only got one thing on it so it'll point towards the target location so it's a find a random location now we could do one that built in uh, task of move to but move to won't work in this case because the uh, AI has got root motion turned on so we have to make our own move to in a moment for now that'll do we'll come back to this in a moment the next thing we do is assign the AI to this monster so on the AI we need to also make an AI controller so go to add a new blueprint class and you can see player control in the list we don't want that one we want the AI controller basically telling the computer to control this character so in all classes drop down at the bottom type in AI controller and choose select and go monster wait for the auto save to finish Uh, come on. Oh, it's crashed. Amazing. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay. Well, we're almost at the end of the first part anyway, so we'll end it there. I'll fix anything up ready for the second part. So if you want to watch the second part where we finish off the AI of the monster, um, some come subscribe to Patreon. The link towards the live stream will be posted there. Uh, what we're going to be doing is finishing off the AI controller and uh, making the AI chase you and walk you about as well as putting in the cutscenes and the uh, other elements which make the game scarier such as lighting and so forth okay thank you very much for joining me on my li first ever live stream if you've enjoyed this please subscribe and comment and everything else to this channel it's much appreciated and please consider supporting me over on patreon where you can get access to the second part of this video plus many more uh, such as early access to new videos um, exclusive access to the discord server where you can chat to me one-to-one -one whenever you like um, as well as many other things too um, yeah thank you very much and for those who i'll see you later i'll see you later on otherwise goodbye for me and i'll see you all very soon bye bye